Now let's consider the political economy of tariffs, or what determines tariffs when in fact we do find them. It's often a puzzle why there are tariffs, since most economists favor free trade, especially for developed nations. Yet tariffs do persist, and the world seems to be foregoing some possible gains from trade. It is worth noting that, overall, tariffs do seem to be falling, as you can see in the broad contours of this graph. A lot of these significant tariffs which remain, especially in the United States and Europe, tend to be on agriculture. In the United States, for instance, products such as dairy and vegetables tend to have published tariffs in the range of 20 to 30 percent. We find some U.S. agricultural products which have very high published tariffs, over 100 percent in some cases, and those would include chocolate, some kinds of cheese, ham, and peanuts. As for non-agricultural products, in the United States you can find noticeable tariffs on these products. This would be auto parts, brooms, leatherware, sneakers, and decorative glassware, among other examples. The analytic question, of course, is what do all these have in common? And on that we have only partial answers. Perhaps the most common general explanation for tariffs is a public choice theory which refers to the distinction between concentrated benefits and diffuse costs. For instance, imagine that you have quite a small group of producers and each would gain individually a large amount from the tariff. They will find it relatively easy and relatively profitable to push for imposing the tariff. Imagine also at the same time that the costs from that tariff are borne by, say, 310 million American consumers. Those costs are quite diffuse. Each individual only loses a small amount from the tariff, they're not going to be well informed about the tariff, and they probably won't find it worthwhile to organize against the tariff. Tariffs, therefore, tend to favor relatively small and relatively well-organized groups, as pointed out by the economist Manker Olson. A related factor to Olson's hypothesis is the geographic concentration of producers, especially in a federalistic system. So in the United States, for instance, a large number of farmers live in Iowa, and the congressmen from Iowa, the representatives and the senators, when working in Washington, they tend to represent those farm interests and to push for farm protectionism and also subsidies to farmers. This political force probably would be weaker if farmers were spread out evenly across the entire country, but of course they're not. Another possible factor behind protectionism is that workers will support their own industry. So, for instance, in the 1980s, a lot of American automobile manufacture was located in Michigan. That manufacture was under the threat of Japanese and other imports, and a lot of people in Michigan, most of all auto workers, seemed to favor some degree of protectionism. Yet another factor behind trade policy seems to be foreign policy considerations. So, for instance, during the Cold War, it was common that the United States would try to strike up free trade-based relationships with other nations for the ostensible purpose of keeping them away from communism and an alliance with the Soviet Union. More recently, the United States, Western Europe, and other nations have tried to bring Russia and China into the World Trade Organization, successfully in both cases, with the hope that this will help those economies liberalize and perhaps eventually move them both closer to some kind of democracy. The most important formal model of trade protection comes from a famous piece from the 1990s. It's called Protection for Sale, and it's written by Grossman and Heltman. They model politics as a kind of auction process through which different interest groups are bidding for tariffs. It might be most efficient to have no tariffs at all, but given that we're going to have some tariffs, what happens is that groups, in essence, put in different bids into the political process, and we end up with a system of relatively efficient tariffs. We then end up with what is called a constrained efficient result, and we end up with the following predictors of tariffs. First, is an industry politically organized? Industries which are politically organized are more likely to have tariffs in their favor. 
Second, what is the import elasticity of a good with respect to tariffs? And third, what is the import penetration ratio for a given good? Let's look at those latter two in more detail. The import elasticity rule is that tariffs will be relatively high when the imports are in inelastic demand. This comes from something in microeconomics known as the Ramsey tax rule. If you need to review the Ramsey tax rule, please use Google. But just note for now, the Ramsey tax rule implies that you have lower deadweight losses when you impose taxes or tariffs or price markups on goods with relatively inelastic demand. Now, going back to the protection for sale setting, if you imagine interest groups bidding for different policies, well, the policies most likely to win that auction will be the policies with relatively low deadweight losses, and those will be the policies which place import taxes on products with relatively inelastic demand. When it comes to the import penetration ratio, the protection for sale theory predicts that when you have a low import penetration ratio, that tends to lead to high protectionism. The intuition here is simply that the tariff penalizes consumers less when the import penetration ratio is relatively low. That said, this perhaps runs counter to our intuition that maybe we expect to find higher tariffs or higher pressures for tariffs in areas where competition from foreign products is increasing. And in this regard, empirically, the production for sale model has not held up in every regard. Overall, there were some early papers providing some quite definite support for the protection for sale model, and you'll find those papers referenced here. You can find them online. Nonetheless, more recent results are mixed, and you can track those down by using Google with keywords protection for sale being very useful. In addition to what's already been listed, I would recommend these sources on the debate. There are some very useful lecture notes by Dave Donaldson on trade policy empirics, which you can find online. Also, see our other videos, one on trade and tariff history, one on who supports free trade, and also one on optimal tariff theory. They cover some other angles and corners of the same general question. There's Grossman and Heltman, and it's still an excellent book to read, Mank Carlson, The Logic of Collective Action.